Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Crash and today we're talking about one of the most important movements of manga history, the Year 24 group. And that's no exaggeration, mind you, but if you're a manga reader and never heard about the Year 24, that's natural. I personally only heard about it a couple of years ago, when I started talking to people who were more into Jojo manga than I was. Because yes, Year 24 is a shoujo movement, THE shoujo movement that defined the demographic forever. If you want to know how shoujo was before the year 24 appeared, I recommend checking my previous manga 101 video on the lost era of shoujo. But today we're starting with Hideko Mizuno. Now, Hideko Mizuno is a major player of shoujo in the years prior to year 24. She started her career as an assistant of Osamu Tezuka himself and in 1955 she would become one of the earliest female mangaka, with her debut work Akake Koma Pony. She would become more well known with her 1963 work White Troika, but it was in 1969 that her biggest success was released. It was called Fire and it was a pioneer in a lot of regards. It was one of the first shoujo manga to feature a male protagonist and one not traditionally found in the pages of shoujo either. Far from being the Shining Prince, Heron is a rebellious rocker inspired in the wave of rock bands that emerged at the time. Mizuno herself being an avid fan of prog acts like Pink Floyd, who in 1969 were starting to move away from the Beatles inspired albums and dealing with the leaving of their frontman Sid Barrett. That's not relevant to this video, I just also happen to be an avid fan of Pink Floyd. But Fire's biggest contribution to the genre wasn't the male protagonist. Jojo by this time had turned into a genre for children, girls, and the teams were tame. Sure, the 60s saw a small expansion of teams explored, but Fire dealt with topics like sex and drugs, which were definitely controversial back then. But it was also these topics that assured that Fire was a hit title among teenage girls and opened the door for the upcoming mangaka to grab Jojo and turn it into a genre for teenagers, like what had happened with Shonen just a decade prior. The 70s saw a huge boom of female mangaka compared to previous decades. There's a couple of factors that led to this. The number of female mangaka in shoujo had been increasing since the late 50s and it showed the girls of the 50s and 60s that they too could be mangaka. And these girls, now turned women, started to debut in the early 70s. Male writers also started shifting more and more into just working on shonen, also leaving more space for female writers. Jojo manga also started to accept submissions works from readers like Kadanshan, Nakayoshi and Shueisha's Ribbon. This was how most of these new wave of mangaka started their works, debuting in their late teens. Most of these new mangaka were born in between the 20th and the 25th year of the Showa era, which is why this wave was given the name of Year 24 group. Showa 24 being the year of 1949 in our calendar, which is why this group is also commonly called the Magnificent or the Fabulous 49ers. To note that most of them weren't born exactly in 1949, it just around that time of the late 40s. The success of CC's manga penned by women showed the editors that stories written by women were more likely to be successful, which led to a lot of these teen mangaka to be hired, but it also led them to be less strict on what was published, which helped this new wave tackle themes and topics that simply hadn't been seen in Jojo before. A lot of works from the year 24 also borrowed a lot of European settings and aesthetic, like one of the most famous manga of the decade, The Rose of Rizels by Ryoko Ikeda, released in 1972. The Rose of Rizels is one of the first, if not the first, historical manga in shoujo, being about the French Revolution and following the life of Marie Antoinette, but the most popular character was a creation from Ikeda in the form of the androgynous Lady Oscar. Lady Oscar was a political statement from Ikeda's part, as was the entire manga. Ikeda was part of the new left movement, and she wanted to use the story and characters as a metaphor for the struggles and battles that women of Japan were having in the early 70s. With Lady Oscar being raised in the world of men and proving herself to be as capable, if not more than them. And the character definitely resonated people because the manga became huge. It was one of the very first shoujo to be published in Tankobon or paperback format and sold over 15 million copies, being the 14th best selling shoujo manga of all time. According to an interview with Moto Agyo, she believes that the success of Rose of Rizel sales is what showed companies that it was viable to publish shoujo manga in this format and what led it to be common practice. This manga is also notably the first to be commercially translated in North America in 1983, albeit only the first two volumes. It obviously had an anime adaptation in 1979 and a movie tie-in which was released in 1987. This anime focuses more on Oscar and maybe because of that it's known as Lady Oscar outside of Japan. Lady Oscar was also the name of a live action movie, also from 1979, based on the manga. It's actually an English language movie filmed in France. Perhaps, weirdly enough, one of the most popular adaptations of The Rose of Rizels is the musical version. It's the most popular musical of Takarazuka Revue, a very famous all-female theater trope who saw a new boom in popularity once they started doing Rose of Rizels. 
the manga also caused the boom of people learning French and made Brazil a popular tourist destination among Japanese people. The manga was so popular that it made people actually pay attention to what was happening and would happen in the Chojo manga scene. Critics were now looking at the demographic as something with potential to be more than just stories for little girls. It also helped that Pope Clan was released around the same time. Written and drawn by one of the biggest names of the year 24, Moto Hagio, also in 1972. The book line was never the title the Rose of Rizdals was, but it did sell 3.5 million copies and it proved to be pretty successful and influential in its own right, especially in the relationship between the main characters, Edgar and Alan, and I see what you did there, Agio. The relationship is not homosexual in nature, but it does have homoerotic elements that would be explored in Agio's later works and made it one of the main faces of the emergence of boys' love. Other than Moto Agyo, Takemi Keiko is another major player in the creation of Boy's Love and its popularity among the year 24, as she was responsible for creating the very first Boy's Love manga in 1970 in the Sunroom. Hagyo Moto would also write various BL manga throughout the decade, like The Art of Thomas in 1974 and The Song of the Wind and Tree in 1976. This manga, more so than any heavy fetishism of homosexuality, were more dramatic stories about the exploration of oneself and their sexuality. One of the reasons that is sought for Boys Love to become a prominent thing in this era is because of its flexibility compared to heterosexual stories in Chojo. Well, yes, the editors were more loose in what they allowed, when it came to relationships between the female main characters and the boys, there were expectations the editors wanted met. Quote Michelle Shaman's Passion Friendship, which is the main resource this video is based, by the way, quoting herself the manga researcher Yukari Fujimoto, many shoujo manga stories in the 1970s centered on a girl who finds her identity and self-worth through a close emotional bond with a boy. The girl, who sees herself as an unpopular, clumsy and unattractive, eventually achieves happiness by completely subsuming her desires into a relationship with the one boy who loves her in spite of her defects. Having made passivity a virtue, the only way a girl can find true love is by sacrificing herself to her boy. Deprived of agency, the girl must rely solely on the power of love to achieve her goal. This traditional romantic structure that is still present today wasn't necessarily what these writers wanted to write about. Year 24's biggest common trait was stories about finding and learning their own identity. With boys love being, well, about boys, the editors weren't expecting these characters to go through the female character arc, even despite the fact that the main characters of these stories tended to be fairly feminine, which meant these writers could self-insert themselves as boys and tell the stories they wanted to tell, while at the same time showing what children could be without these gender restrictions. The stories were not so much about gay characters and more about almost a gender-neutral romance, as a way for these girls to be able to write and relate to many stories not bound by the gender roles they are expected to abide to. The year 24 was not just stuck in boys' love when it came to exploration of sexuality, though. Ikira's Claudine would be the first manga about a transgender character, and Shiroi Heia no Futari by mangaka Ryoko Yamagishi is considered to be the first girls' love manga. It's hard to talk about all the important manga and authors from this time, because the biggest thing that the year 24 brought to Chojo was not only more mature themes, but also an expansion of genres covered, with historical and sci-fi being some of the most relevant. One of the biggest titles in the group's history isn't even shoujo. Towards the Terra, a sci-fi epic written by Keiko Takemiya, is actually shonen, which shows the versatility of these mangaka. One of the things that the group gave to the shoujo from an aesthetic point of view was an evolution of Takeshi Makoto's style that I mentioned in a previous video. The sparkly eyes and backgrounds came into full form during this era, while shoujo from the late 50s and 60s showed an evolution in terms of paneling, the year 24 also expanded on that, moving borders and panels altogether a lot of times which let them be much more experimental in their page layout than manga had been up to this point. The success of these mangaka helped people shift their perception of what shoujo was supposed to be. It led to people actually look at the demographic as worthy as shonen, and critics and scholars of literature and manga finally looked at shoujo's way. But they saw Year 24 not as a progression or an evolution of the genre, but rather a reset. The true beginning of Chojo, the Year Zero. But I'd argue that's not the case. Yes, they were a revolution and they changed the genre forever. But it wasn't overnight, and they wouldn't have done it without the contributions of the mangaka that came before them, like Takeshi Makoto, Shikako Urano, and Indeku Mizuno. Likewise, the year 24 opened the doors for the upcoming mangaka. Hagiyu and Keiko used to live in the same house, and they would let other mangaka and soon-to-be mangaka use their house as a gathering place, where they could work together, help each other, and share ideas. This place was known as the Oizumi Salon, due to the fact that it was located in the... Uh, this place. While some of the mangaka that gathered there were fellow Year 24 members, like Nanai Sazaya, who brought a lot of horror manga to Chojo, most of the people there would only debut years after and be part of a subgroup called Post Year 24, which, as the name indicates, were a group of new mangaka directly associated with Year 24 and its influence. 
From there on out, Chojo would continue to evolve and become the demographic we know it today. Who knows where it would be without her influence? If you do want to know more about the year 24, I'm going to leave some reads on the description below that I use as reference. If you can, I definitely recommend checking out Passion Friendship, The Aesthetics of Girls Culture in Japan by Deborah Michelle Shaman, as it was the biggest guideline I used for both shoujo videos, and it contains more information about the formative years of shoujo than I included here. If you want to know more about manga in general, I recommend checking my Manga 101 videos and consider subscribing, as I'll most definitely continue to make more of them. Then, if you watch this little here, thank you very much. And I'll see you next video.